Welcome to Recovery Corner, where the many pathways of recovery intersect. This is a space where you will hear personal stories of triumph in recovery, gain insights into various recovery-oriented systems, and learn how leaders across the country are building recovery-ready communities. The Recovery Corner podcast does not provide clinical advice. But before we get into it, let's take a minute to talk about something that's super important, especially if you're in college or have a loved one who is. Soberlink. We know college can be a hotbed for drinking culture, and staying sober in that environment can be a real challenge. Soberlink is all about helping you prove your sobriety and stay accountable to the people who care about you most, all while you're away from home. They're on a mission to erase the stigma around addiction and let you take control of your life. How it works is super simple. Soberlink's super high-tech portable breathalyzer sends real-time blood alcohol content results to your chosen contacts. It's basically your trusty sidekick on your sober journey, making accountability as easy as a single breath. So, if you're ready to take the next step in your recovery or want to help a loved one to do the same, check out Soberlink. You won't just be buying a product, you'll be joining a community that truly gets what you're going through. To learn more, visit Soberlink.com forward slash YPR. They're even offering an exclusive $50 off your device to the YPR audience. Trust me, your future self will thank you. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Recovery Corner. Today, we have a very special back to school episode since Students across the country have been getting back to school, back on college campuses, and we have a very exciting full panel of guests from the University of Denver to talk about binge drinking on college campuses with us. So I'm going to go ahead and have them introduce themselves now. Uh, Waltrina, would you like to go first? Sure. My name is Dr. Waltrina DeFrance Dufour. I'm the director of our collegiate recovery program in the Health and Counseling Center. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Aronson. I am the Collegiate Recovery Coordinator here at the University of Denver, also in the Health and Counseling Center. And I'm very excited to be here today and share about my experience in the Collegiate Recovery Program. My name is Sabine Kepler. I am a student here at the University of Denver, and I've been a member of the Collegiate Recovery Community for about the year I've been in school now. Excited to be here. And I'm Jesse McGinty. I'm the Director of Health Promotion, which is also part of the Health and Counseling Center at DU. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you know my voice. I am Meg. I work for young people in recovery. And I am myself a young person in recovery. I've been in recovery since I was myself a student at DU. All right. So like I said earlier, today we're going to be talking about binge drinking and substance use on college campuses and talking about how the universities are addressing these issues on campus. So according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2021, about 27% or roughly a quarter of college students binge drink at least once a month. And binge drinking is defined as four or more drinks on a single occasion for women or five or more for men. So that is quite a bit of alcohol, and it is not uncommon for students to engage in party-type behavior. So I just want to start off by talking a little bit about that. So can you tell me what alcohol and substance use looks like on college campuses like DU? So we were fortunate enough to be able to do the American College Health Association's National College Health Assessment, which is a really long title, but something that colleges do every few years to kind of gauge health and well-being on college campuses. Um, We're also lucky enough to be in um, a cohort of other colleges in um, the state of Colorado. And so we actually have some recent data from the last spring that kind of does look at some of these um, behaviors. Um, There was like an average of 12% response rate because it is college students answering a survey in the spring, Um, but it was still useful to see even if not completely generalizable. Um, It showed that out of those 10 um, college campuses, Almost 80% of students had ever consumed alcoholic beverages, 
We did see the highest in cis women with 81% versus 74% in cis men and 76% in trans or gender non-conforming. Um, but 72% had consumed in the last three months. So 55% in the last two weeks. So we are seeing pretty high rates of usage, um, which I think is continues to sort of be the trend that from past years of the same survey as well. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Those numbers sound roughly right to me. I am not surprised by any of them, but could you tell me a little bit about why students may be particularly vulnerable to binge drinking specifically? Sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of um, cultural aspects to it. They're in often a new and unfamiliar environment. So it might be the first time they're living on their own and adjusting to kind of some new norms, new culture and expectations. Um, it might be a time of experimentation with newfound freedom. They might feel a little bit invincible in that age where they're young and they feel like they can recover from anything. Um, and that self-discovery. So there's a lot of, you know, trying things for the first time, but also a lot of incomplete information on alcohol and substance use. There's always going to be peer pressure and that perceived social norms and perceived risk or lack thereof. Um, and we also know that we're seeing a lot of social anxiety, especially coming out of COVID. So coming into a new situation, not feeling like you have the confidence or the social skills to really decrease that tension and relax in new social situations. I think we also are seeing a lot of that. And we also know that in the first six weeks of any new school year, we call it the red zone because there's just an increased prevalence in parties. Um, potential lack of appropriate coping skills to deal with things like new stressors, academic and social pressures, that sudden disconnection from previous social networks and supports. Um, so while there's a, a ton of different um, components, that's a lot of what we see in general for especially new students coming into college for the first time. Yeah, and I do think that that culture piece is particularly important because, you know, most people, when they think about college, they think of it as party time. So that culture, a lot of people are also feeling pressured into drinking or using substances, you know, partying is what you do at college. But um, yeah, so I think that culture piece is very important. But can you tell me a little bit about what universities like DU are doing to kind of help mitigate the uh, problem of binge drinking on campus? Absolutely. I mean, overall, there is a shift away from abstinence-based education to more harm reduction lens. So different universities take various approaches, but I think um, are more are kind of in adopting and embracing that harm reduction um, model. Um, in DU, we are fortunate to, enough to have health promotion coordinators that have specific focus areas. So we actually have an amazing coordinator for alcohol and other drugs that focuses on harm reduction strategies in education. Before DU students come to campus for the first time um, in the summer before their first quarter, they are required to do some online modules that do talk about um, alcohol and safer drinking strategies. Uh, once they come onto campus, we have a requirement from our undergraduate student government that all incoming uh, first and transfer students must also do um, an intervene active bystander training, which includes signs of alcohol poisoning, as well as opioid overdose signs, um, but really also to look out for each other. It talks about making safe plans, um, sticking together, intervening when something seems off. And then another really nice thing that our undergrad student government has required is um, our registered student organizations are required to complete a harm reduction workshop. And while they have uh, six different options to choose from, one of those is called bartending school. And that goes in and teaches groups of students about um, how to have safer drinking strategies, what a uh, serving size looks like, um, ways that they can, again, look out for some of those signs and symptoms, so that's another great way to educate students that are involved in organizations. Um, and we also have something called Thriving on Your 21st Birthday, which is led by, by our undergrad peer health educators, which is a team of paid and trained undergraduate students. And so for those turning 21, they can sign up for a brief educational session with a peer educator to create a safer drinking strategy, receive a coupon book for local businesses for their birthday celebrations that don't all center around alcohol. Those are just a couple of the things we're doing, um, but we also um, try and partner with the Collegiate Recovery Program on a variety of different events to get um, 
awareness out around what all that they do for the recovery community. Um, and then we also provide a variety of harm reduction supplies around kind of those key times during the year, like Halloween, spring break. We have a winter carnival here at DU. Um, and we recently got a, a mobile cart. So we'll be going around campus with some harm reduction um, supplies and strategies to kind of meet students where they are as well. I definitely remember going through the in intervene training when I was a student at DU, and it sounds like it's evolved a little bit since I took it in 2018. Um, I don't remember much of the opioid stuff. It was mostly alcohol focused at the time. So when did that evolve? Well, Trina may be able to speak a little bit more to that, but in the last few years when we've just kind of seen the increase in fentanyl overdoses, we are also giving out Narcan um, when people go through the opioid overdose response training with the um, collegiate recovery community. Um, we also give out fentanyl testing strips. And so kind of just to set the stage, especially for those who are not familiar with fentanyl and how prevalent it is um, or not familiar with kind of um, Colorado in general, we just try to give them a PSA to let them know ahead of time and to also give them those same sort of signs and symptoms to look out for in case they do um, come across someone that's experiencing an overdose. Well, Trina, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. When I came to DU October 1, 2018, prior to that, about a year earlier, a student named Jonathan Winnefeld had asked for recovery housing and we didn't have actual recovery housing, but it was a sober safe space. Um, where he overdosed and passed away. And so Dr. Michael LaFarre, our assistant vice chancellor for Health and Counseling Center, was already passionate about recovery, but this really gave the spark to be able to advocate and secure the collegiate recovery program space, our physical um, building, as well as funding to hire two full-time staff to start a collegiate recovery program. And so out of that, Jonathan Winnefeld's parents um, James Winnefeld, Admiral James Winnefeld, and Mary started the SAFE project. And it's to help get institutions of higher education across the country to establish and give them technical assistance to create the infrastructure for a collegiate recovery program. So we um, started saying, how can we really make our students more aware and our campus more aware about the impact of opioid overdose and fentanyl overdose? and how fentanyl is mixed in with different opioids. And so Dr. Michael Farr created a proposal and submitted it to the chancellor who supported it. And we purchased our naloxone, we bought kits, we filled them and put them all across campus in any space so that students, faculty and staff had access to naloxone. We were the second, I believe, institution in the country to actually do that. So wow. really excited about that. Mm -hmm. It's tragic that something so terrible has to happen to initiate these kinds of things, but it sounds like in general, it has benefited the community. So it's great to see universities taking action when a problem becomes so prevalent, like the opioid crisis. Absolutely. I also seem to remember from my time at DU, there were many uh, substance-free events on days like Halloween where there would be events set up with games or other activities to give people an alternative to going out to parties or drinking or using substances. Uh, can you guys, can somebody speak a little bit to those events? Yeah, I can start us off and then maybe while Trina and Kelly can and add to that, um, this year for the National College Alcohol Awareness Week, we are doing kind of a Halloween party, but also educational fair and um, doing that ahead of time for Halloween to make sure that students sort of have information about safer drinking strategies um, and resources ahead of time um, as a way to make sure they're really thinking about these things, kind of including some social justice components, some um, consent related things since it uh, overlaps with our Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, and really making sure that students are connected to the resources ahead of time. Um, but then I know that there's also a Harvest Festival that is taking place later on and a couple of great homecoming opportunities well, as well. Yes, yeah, so the Collegiate Recovery Program, some of the sober events, an example is the Sober Tailgate, having an option for students who want to go to the DU hockey games instead of going to the pre-parties with alcohol. A lot of them are invited to come to the CRC and have a sober tailgate. I'm sure you're familiar as an alum of the Winter Carnival. 
we've had a lot of students say, I really want to go skiing. I just don't want to go with a group of people who might be partaking in things that they shouldn't be. So we host a sober ski trip during the spring break. We also have students, you know, do you, 80% of our students study abroad. And so we have a lot of students who want to study abroad, but they know they're able to drink abroad and they kind of just want to be around people who practice, um, you know, not using substances or just a safe environment without any alcohol. So we are hosting our very first sober study course and we're going to UK and we're almost filled in that course. So we're, we try to do things that are like substitute or complement in addition to our basic fun things like going bowling and roller skating and um, and Sabine can probably speak to some of the other fun things. We go to Top Golf as a community where they learn how to have fun, sober fun, while being in an environment that might have bar and alcohol. Um, so yeah, those are just a few other things. Yeah, Sabine, I would love to hear about your experience at some of these events that we're talking about. Yeah, um, I don't know. For me, it was really it was really awesome to just come here and have like some things to start us off. Like we went to Top Golf at the beginning of this quarter and same the beginning of last year when I started as a freshman. And it was really cool to meet other people who were sober like I was. And because I didn't come to DU like when I was out in the world drinking, but I came here sober and I was really nervous about like the community and where I would find my footing. But I'm I'm not sure. Um, I don't think I've been to as many events as most people, but the ones that I've been to kind of planned by the CRC were really good starters for me to hang out with some people, for me to get friends, people to study with. And we, I remember the last Halloween, we watched a movie in the, in the CRC building together for Halloween. And I also really like our recovery milestone dinners that we have um, because it's, it brings me back to like being grateful for all these people that I can have around me all the time. And it's awesome. It's awesome to be in a building with people in the sober dorms and to have people at the meetings that I can share to when I need to and study with and everything. Yeah. As most people know, building recovering, building community in recovery is a very important part, especially in early recovery. So it's really great that programs like DU's program are allowing that space where people can find those people while having fun. Mm -hmm. I do want to shift gears a little bit and talk about DU's uh, collegiate recovery community a little bit. But first, can somebody please define what exactly a collegiate recovery program or community is? Sure. This is Waltrina again, and I'd love to. So collegiate recovery program actually has been around for about 30 years, just without a title. Institutions like Texas Tech, Brown University, Augsburg, Rutgers, they were supporting students. They had academic departments with substance use disorder focuses. So out of that evolved a need for universities in the nation to really rally around how could we support students in recovery. Hence the beginning of the Association of Recovery in Higher Ed about 15 years ago now. And so a collegiate recovery program is a space and um, a community of students where they can practice getting their um, education using coping skills without having to sacrifice their recovery. And so a program is a place where an institution will provide full-time salaried staff, will provide a physical location for students to meet. Some programs, not all, will have recovery housing. So we have an apartment building next to our Collegiate Recovery Center building. And there's 14 beds in there, but they're all apartments. We have studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and it's designated as a safe space. So collegiate recovery programs can also have sober events, sober trips, sober study abroads. Um, We have recovery milestone meetings where we celebrate anniversaries of students. But we also um, have several, like six recovery meetings. So it's a place that it's peer driven. And we're here to support them. We let them know the center is their space to hang out. Um, And we also have a mindfulness meditation garden, a sustainable garden where they can come and pick food that they cook for their dinners or that they want to prepare in their home. I think something Sabine said that really um, made me want to speak to this is the community I see them build as residents of recovery housing. They literally will like text each other and say, I'm cooking dinner. Anybody want to come over? I'm working on a puzzle. So when you're early in recovery, and I want to address 
um, your next question about how do we help students. When you're new and early in recovery and you're a current DU student, you're like, I can't go on with these friends groups right now. I need some friends who are sober. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be stigmatized. So finding the CRP and moving into a recovery housing space gives them a built-in safe community where they can go to meetings together. Um, so it really helps them in early recovery. So the other population of students come from maybe like a 5280 recovery high school. We have 30 to 40 students visiting us October 17th where they're gonna to tour and see our campus, see our recovery housing. And so some students come to us already in recovery. Some of them have a year or two. Um, and then we have grad students who come. We have students who transfer from other schools. We have students who think if they do a geographical cure, right? Like if I leave this university and go to DU, maybe it'll be different. And we, we work with those students to help them understand wherever you go, there you are. So we help them build their community. So those are the four types of students um, that kind of come into the collegiate recovery program. I will say some institutions, we have 4,398 universities in the United States. And out of those, there's only 151 programs. And of those, some are just communities like Colorado State University. They have a great group of students who just meet together, but they don't have full-time staff. They're student volunteers. So it can vary across the, the board of what a program looks like, and it might just be a community. I had no idea that it was so rare. I'm actually shocked by how low that number is. You said 151? 151. And I will say we have an advisory council that's helping to build um, more collegiate recovery programs, Safe Project. You know, we're a very collaborative field. It's new to student affairs. It's not going away. It'll be included in NASPA and our cost standards in the future, things that are pertinent to higher ed speak. So forgive me for that language. But yes, it is new, but it isn't going anywhere. And it's like Chickering. He wrote about student development theory and he talks about students have crisis today in his book, Spiritual Authenticity, because they have nothing to hold on to. So we develop all these programs and initiatives, but we don't get to the core of when they're having a crisis on the inside, what can they lean on, right? What do they do to cope? So I think collegiate recovery programs really speak to that, as well as DEI. We see a high percentage of students who are members of the LGBTQ community having an SUD. And so how do we help them? So it's a group of students that probably ordinarily wouldn't mix, but they have multiple identities, but they bond around, they have a common problem and a common solution. And that's what helps them to support each other. All of those other identities are important, but their current identity, it's recovery identity. We look at what recovery capital do they have that we can help them. So when students come into us, we do an intake and we develop a recovery wellness plan during the recovery coaching session that we're both trained in. And so we're really helping create individualized student success plans so that they can carry these skills out to the workforce. Um, and if it's okay, I'd speak to how do we maintain recovery. So um, before we get to maintaining, how we also help them is I love DU because we have a collaborative umbrella of care mm -hmm. so that students don't fall through the cracks. And so we partner with all of our other student affairs units. And we have a continuum where it's from Jesse's team, from prevention. Like how do we let them become aware? So that way they could even be aware of, here's some symptoms of what a substance use disorder might look like. Um, you know, I might be a heavy drinker, problem drinker. Okay, I've crossed the line and I probably need to be assessed. And we have a counseling team that can do that. And then if they need to take a leave and go on a treatment, we have a system that students can take a leave, go through student outreach and support. And then when they're ready to come back, we partner with SOS as part of the reentry process. They can't register for classes until they click on this reentry form and they see that they can get support from the Health and Counseling Center, from Disability Services, which we know recovery is protected under ADA. Um, and then they also can reach out to us for the Learning Effectiveness Program. And so that was, a, I think, a gap that DU collaboratively came together to say, we need to let students know when they're returning from treatment that they can access recovery housing here, that they don't have to be a stopout, that they don't have to be afraid to come back to school because they don't have a safe space. So that's part of the way we help maintain. We do a lot of um, prevention around how do we help them not return to use. So that's part of their recovery wellness plan. 
And I love what Jesse said, like we have different realms of harm reduction here. It could be, I just want to be able to socialize. Will you socialize safely? We're going to assume it's all of our legal adults, um, but they want to learn how to be safe. We also have students who are like, you know, I can drink alcohol, but I can't do this other substance. So we try to help them not misuse things because overdose can happen. You don't have to have a substance use disorder for an overdose to happen. Mm-hmm. And we have students who are like, I need to cut back. And that's where we come in. We try to serve that group as well, where they want to cut back and then abstain. So we have two types of communities where it's they're abstaining. And then we do individual recovery coaching for a harm reduction approach. And so our meetings look like LGBTQ. We have transgender on Sundays. We have a grad meeting. Um, just because they, you know, they have different issues that they're facing. And so they asked to start their own meeting. Now we're super excited because our associate director for Fraternity Sorority Life approached us and wants to have a recovery meeting just for FSL. So because when they're trying to get sober and you're in a frat or a sorority, the dynamics that can happen. So we have that meeting. And then Monday nights is our all recovery pathway. So you can be in any program, non-program, you could be an atheist, whatever. We have students attending. And then we're excited about our EDA, our Eating Disorder Anonymous group that just started. So I bring that up to say a lot of our programs that we offer support a lot of comorbidity, co-occurring. Um, a lot, it's very popular to know like someone's having um, anxiety with their SUD. Another important collaboration is admissions. Um, we're training the tour guides today so that they can really express what the CRP is in that one to two minute elevator chat. Um, and then we also work with them when a student, we're in our brochure, we have admissions in our brochure, and it says not a student yet. And we talk to them about, you can write an addendum, how to write a letter explaining why you have gaps in your transcripts. Um, and that, you know, maybe we need to give them a chance. I will say we're one of the institutions that doesn't hold felonies against students and still attend to you. You know, our protocol is the case has to be resolved, but we don't hold that against people. So those are just some of the ways that we're collaborative and try to help maintain. Um, We do referrals. We can do them directly or anonymously to let our support team at Do You Know, we have a student that might be in trouble, but honestly, and I, I think Sabine might be able to speak to this, I find our students maintain a recovery because they hold each other accountable. They're there when the going gets rough. And when it's rough, they all get going to support that person. But I, I'll um, leave it at that. And maybe Sabine has something to share on that. Yeah, Sabine, do you have anything to add on to that about how the students support each other? Yeah, um, I don't know. I always felt like when I, because I do live in the dorms right now, as I previously expressed, um, Like, I always feel like, dude, I can go knock on the person across the hall's door and she will open the door with like open arms and be like, are you okay?" And like, I would do that for anyone else. Um, Like, and it's it's also it's also really cool, though, because it doesn't always need to happen. Like if I'm not like in my room or if someone else isn't in my room, I can always go around and always go call someone and be like hey are you going to be around do you want to go ahead an outside meeting do you want to go do this um I remember last year I had a roommate and we were just coming back from the dining hall and we decided to explore the CRC building and we went down at the basement like the meditation room and just sat there for a little bit and talked about like what we're excited and nervous for for the upcoming school year and I it's really cool because being around these people for long amounts of times and being in meetings with them, getting to be vulnerable about what you're excited for for school, what you're nervous about, your past with like alcohol and drug use with school, you get to know people and you get to trust people and people get to trust you and you get to be like, be okay or not okay with the people around you. It's really great to hear about how supportive this whole community is. And that's also going back to what Waltrina was saying before about how they are very supportive of a lot of different identities within recovery and that everybody is united under the umbrella of being in recovery, either abstaining or practicing moderation, harm reduction. Everybody has something in common and you can talk to anybody within that group. A lot of what our coordinator does is work directly with the students. So they it's like a drop-in center. We were talking about our space. They literally come in and they run the building. We have offices here. It's like their building. But some of the things that I do is work with the faculty and staff 
and outward facing communities. So I know um, you had a question about how can universities improve Mm -hmm. and what more can we do to create a safer college experience? So I would say DU has really given us the institutional support and funding, for example, with the Narcan, um, but being able to train faculty and staff, um, getting buy-in from different deans and being able, like I said, to collaborate with campus partners is huge. We're also a part of the Colorado Consortium for the Prevention of Prescription Use. And so they have different work groups. We partner with health promotion team. Um, the AOD coordinator, she serves on the harm reduction committee. Kelly serves on the treatment work group committee. I serve on the affected friends and family and the recovery group. So having access to the attorney general's office and to SAMHSA and the local state national constituents really helps us to get the word out to students that there is a collegiate recovery program here in Denver at the University of Denver and just being up to date with policies and protocols on how we can support and seek funding to support. We provide scholarships for our students and a lot of sometimes our students do face housing insecurity or food insecurity. Um, I also like to stress how collegiate recovery is a social justice issue. Mm-hmm just about stigmatizing. Like we really need to work on that too, to support students, but it's also about having access to treatment. If you don't have quality insurance, you can have insurance, but your quality of insurance may not get you to the treatment place that you need. That has your, is a student-centered, person-centered focus. So we try to support through our recovery fund, people who need an assessment fee. We also will pay co-pays for students who wanna be seen at our health and counseling center as well as supplement programming and taking them to leadership conferences, recovery conferences. So we do a lot of fundraising and donors. And I think when you have students who are happy with their recovery development, you also are building a strong recovery alumni community, which we're really excited to have at DU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that all sounds really great. I'm honestly really impressed by everything DU is doing. And again, I am surprised by how rare these kinds of programs are. So I'm happy to hear that places like DU are offering these services. But yeah, going back to that question that you alluded to about how universities can improve their collegiate recovery programs, Mm -hmm. if they already have one, which apparently is not a given. um, Mm -hmm. I would like to hear from other people what they think on that. Sabine, I'm actually curious from the student's perspective, what you think can be improved. Well, I think first off, I don't know, for me, the biggest thing was I remember being told about this by a friend about the sober community here, about the CRC. And I was surprised because from what I was looking into with universities, it seemed like they had sober housing, but it wasn't sober housing. It was more not like it was more non-party atmosphere. And Mm -hmm. I think universities like making it clear like this is a safe space for you to be sober, whether that's like I don't know, abstaining from drugs for X amount of time, like whether you just need a longer break from drugs. Um, Because I've encountered a lot of people here. But I think what made me excited about this was that it was so clear that this was a safe space for people to live in and for people to go to the meetings as long as they wished to be off of this kind of drug in their own kind of way. And they respected every other person in there. And I really appreciated the fact that it was so clear, like, this is the help you're going to get here. And with other universities, I I was like, I was kind of, I don't know, iffy about it because like, I got sober when I was 16 years old and college was always a looming, like, not threat to me, but it was kind of a presence that I was worried about. I was like, um, apprehensive about going to college because I was like, for the longest time in my mind, it was like, I'm just going to get sucked back into this party atmosphere that was so romanticized to me when I was in my days of getting high. Um, And I don't know. I I tell my friends about it all the time. And I have a few friends who have came to this school simply because of this, um, this program and these wonderful things that are available to them here. And I think it's really important for schools to look into some kind of community, whether that's, um, what is going on up at CSU because I had a friend who went there and 
at least there's a safe space for people to go and share their thoughts, share their feelings. Um, of course, I wish it was more, but I do believe that having a safe space such as this one, rather than simply putting it in the category of mm, this is a quieter place for people to, you know, maybe use drugs, perhaps, even though it says that they shouldn't. Um, I, I, I do believe it's going to happen either way, some ways in universities. But um, I do think that like, having a safe space is going to be the best place of all and ha like having easier access to things such as the LEP, which I am in the learning enrichment program, which has helped me so much and having access to the LEP also opened up opportunities for me to go and get the disability service program for my ADHD for things that I can't focus well on for extra time and tests. And cause it, like Waltrina said, it, um, it helps with like, putting my recovery on the same platform of importance as my school and being able to work those two things together because stressors are not a fun thing to have when mm -hmm. you are living life on the edge in college, not on the edge, on the edge, but like getting nervous about that versus like getting nervous about a test is kind of like a different thing in my brain. Um, and it really helps to know all the resources I have here and I can ask for help and people will know how to help me. And that makes me happy. And I wish that at other colleges, that was more of a thing. Um, I really do like the system here. And right now I can't say I, I wish for much else. There's a lot of good things about it right now. I'm glad to hear that you feel so supportive, but I do think you're right. It's A, important that universities have these programs, but B, it's almost more important that students know about these programs. They have to tell them that they exist or else nobody's going to be able to use them. And that can be a big problem if students don't know the resources that are available to them. Uh, Jesse, I'm curious if you have anything to add about how universities can improve the way they uh, support students. Well, as my first time working in higher education, I've only gotten to see how amazing a Valtrina has done, you know, creating and, and making um, the collegiate recovery community here grow. And I have to say, she's such a passionate advocate about it. Um, she will take any opportunity to let people know about it or um, know more about the CRP at DU. Um, I think in general, you know, also just like removing barriers. So not only, um, you know, knowing about the resources, but kind of like while Trina was saying with, um, you know, scholarships and funds and health insurance, removing barriers for students to um, get to the help they need or to get the resources they need to. I think um, we, it's nice that we have a medical amnesty policy here at DU as well. So it's really looking more towards the safety of students and making sure that if there is an incident that occurs, students know they can call for help without thinking that they're going to just get, um, you know, a punitive, uh, you know, reaction and get in trouble um, so that if anything was to occur, they're they're going to call for help. Um, I think another great thing that Waltrita alluded to is just the use community of care and what we try to set the precedent for like early on in terms of looking out for each other, taking care of each other, knowing it's all of our responsibility. We just um, finished an 18 month process of going through the Jed Foundation's um, Jed Campus on suicide prevention, which also looks at substance use and alcohol use. And um, not only some great policies that came out of that, that Waltrina helped create, but also um, the training of four mental health first aid trainers so that we can get more staff and faculty that are student facing trained in kind of knowing signs and symptoms of a variety of different challenges, um, but also just to kind of know when something's up and how to kind of talk to a student or talk to a colleague when it feels like something's off. So I think having more effort towards that holistic um, viewpoint of how kind of all of these things intersect, how it's all of our responsibilities to be looking out for each other, I think is something that a lot of universities can learn from. Yeah, I do think it's so important that everybody have that training. I think everybody should know how to talk to people who are experiencing mental health crises. I personally think everybody should know how to administer naloxone, Narcan. Um, other people may have different opinions on that, but that is mine. Um, but it's great to hear that you put such a focus on that. And Kelly, I know a lot has been said. <laughs> do you have anything to add to the question of how universities across the country can improve what they're doing for their students in recovery? 
Hi, Meg. Um, well, I, I, I think most of it has been covered. I will add, um, we try to work really hard with our students and across campus to break the stigma uh, about recovery and surrounding recovery and substance use disorder so that it's recovery is normalized and it's not viewed as a death sentence. It's viewed, viewed as a gift among our students and among um, the population of students who maybe aren't in recovery. We always tell them you can be a recovery ally. You can take a, what is a CRP training, um, a Narcan training, and just represent a population that you can advocate for. Um, we also have a peer ambassador program here at the university where um, we work with our CRP students who maybe are extra out loud about their recovery or more comfortable being leaders within the field. And we work with them to guide the new students and work with the new students to make sure that they're comfortable in the new space because entering a, you know, a sober living or, or a sober housing situation or even being somewhat new in recovery is really important to have a community and people that can kind of take your hand and guide you through it a little bit. Um, I don't know if you can relate or not, but I certainly can. Um, so those are just a couple of the other ways that we we try to make the campus recovery friendly and work with our students to make sure that this is a safe space and it's open for all, um, whether you're ex recovery exploratory or, or identify as being in recovery. Great addition. And I just have one final question for everybody. Everybody has to answer. Um, but that question is, what can students do to make sure that they and their classmates stay safe? Like if you had one piece of advice, what would that advice be? Could uh, we start off with Sabine as a student? <laughs> what advice would you give to your fellow classmates? Um, I'm, I believe communication. Um, honestly, just communication with everyone, because I feel like to understand where someone's at and how they are doing, whether they are using drugs wrong, you need to know what's going on in their head to a basic extent, like seeing the signs it talks about in the intervene training, which yes, I, I also went through that. It was very fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, I, cause I, whenever I'm feeling down, whenever I'm having a bad day, like I need to communicate that to someone, but in the best moments, someone will call me and be like, Hey, how's your day? And I'm going to be like, it's good. It's not amazing, but I get to talk to someone about it and they get to know where I'm at. If I need help, what to help me with. And I believe the training is also good and that's already required. So I think just communicating with everyone and being wary of what everyone is doing and how they're doing. I like that answer. Communication is always key here at YPR. We like to talk about radical honesty because you can't really recover if you're not honest with the people around you, but more importantly, honest with yourself about what you need to change in your behavior and your thought processes in order to get better because it's a process but through recovery people do get better and feel better jesse what advice would you give to students i would just remind them to remember that we all come from different walks of life different perspectives different experiences and backgrounds so to come with curiosity to maybe learn more rather than judgment i think coming into a new community um, in college or otherwise is a great opportunity to learn about something that you haven't experienced. So I think that's one of the ways we can try and combat the stigma around these things um, is just to be curious and thoughtful about it rather than judgmental. Yeah, we're all about destigmatizing and people can destigmatize in a variety of ways. You know, if you hear someone saying something that isn't very nice about the recovery community, you can call it out. You can be careful about the language you use. Um, here at YPR, we don't really like to use language like addict or junkie. We like person-first language. It's a person with substance use disorder, a person in recovery. Little steps like that that people can take to not only change their own mindset, but to try to ripple out and affect the people around them can really be helpful to their own thoughts and also the community as a whole. All right. Well, Trina, what advice do you have? I'm going to defer to Kelly because she actually has to go do a training for our um, tour guide. So I'm going to defer to Kelly. Um, All right, Kelly. Thanks, Altrina. Um, I mean, echoing what everyone else has said, destigmatizing um, 
the negative connotation around substance use disorder and normalizing recovery as as an identity is a major part of the the shift that I I'm lucky and fortunate to watch happen here at DU, um, but that still needs work as as everything else always does. Um, so working to destigmatize recovery, and we don't we don't pressure our students to be in recovery out loud, but um, we want them to be comfortable to be in recovery out loud, to be in an environment where they're able to say that they're in recovery and they're proud of it versus it's stigmatized to mean something negative. So I think just sharing information and constant education and constant growth as individuals on my end and on the student's end. That's perfect. I like that answer. All right. And finally, Waltrina. <laughs> okay. I think I would say um, how to help students keep each other safe would be one, to make sure they complete the recovery ally training so they can be informed and aware of symptoms of if somebody's struggling with an SUD mm -hmm. and the consequences are also a symptom. The different types, whether it's behavioral, academic, um, relationship, interpersonal. Um, the other thing would be the shame. I would say there is no shame in asking for help. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're wondering if you've got a problem with alcohol, you probably have a problem with alcohol. That's what I would say. So if your friend is like, I wonder, because social drinkers don't wonder they have a problem with alcohol or drugs. Mm -hmm. So there is no shame in asking for help. Um, there's no need to suffer in silence. You have to break the silence. The other would be support. When students are planning programming, or even faculty staff, when you're plan when they're planning programming for students, how can we normalize that it's okay to socialize without alcohol at an event? I'm always saying we're wanting our students to be authentic. We want faculty and staff to be authentic. Then why do we have to offer alcohol to be our social lubricant? Why do we call it happy hour and not social hour? Right? We want to show up as our best self. So students, when they're planning, um, they can plan programs that just alcohol doesn't have to be a part of the conversation. And, and that goes for faculty and staff as well. So I think that will overall help us shift our campus from being recovery friendly to recovery ready. When I came, I think we were probably a little recovery hostile. So how we could keep each other safe is if each person does its part and becomes an ally and informed and knows how to intervene, then we have a stronger network of care. Mm -hmm. Because especially now, Narcan is available over the counter as of <laughs> earlier this month, I believe. So everybody can take a Narcan training. There are lots of free options available and just knowing how to recognize an opioid overdose and carrying Narcan. There are lots of ways to keep each other safe, but really education is a key part of it. Just knowing what to look for and how you can help being able to do so. All right, so thank you all so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you everybody else for listening. Please be sure to like, subscribe, follow, whatever on any platform you're on. And we will see you next week. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>